All right, everybody. Uh, thank you again for coming back. Um, lecture two, although maybe it's better to say day two. Uh, today will be so. Last class we covered lectures four, five, and six. Today we're going to try to get through seven, eight, nine, and ten. Um, a lot of examples today, so hopefully that will help you with the uh, with the homework that's coming up. The first homework assignment is due tomorrow. Just got to admit the last student in here. I think everybody is here. Um, like I was saying, it's kind of cool. So I like to, to you know, walk around campus uh, when I'm here. And uh, today, this is just coming out of the um, of the door between uh, the Gleason building and um, what do they call it? Engineering Hall. So building nine and building 17. Uh, there were three fawns just kind of hanging out on the grass over there. So I got probably to within, I don't know, five or 10 feet of them. I uh, took a bunch of pictures, but this is the one that came out the best. So it was pretty cool, um, right? Uh, thought it was pretty fun, pretty uh, pretty unusual. But I tried to flag down somebody else that was walking by and they didn't really seem to care. So maybe it's just me, but I'll share the pictures with my kids too. So they'll, they'll get a kick out of that. Um, so I looked at, from the office hour survey that I had submitted, times that um, that looked good. So I had four of the five students in the class respond. So I've chosen these times for office hours. Um, I feel like Monday and Friday are the best dates because um, that's when the homeworks do, uh, Friday and Monday. Uh, oh yeah, thank you, I will do that. Um, so uh, this is when the homework is due. So I thought that that would be the best time to have office hours. Now, if you do want to try to get together uh, in the time outside of that, you can try to get in touch with me, um, but I can't guarantee. So I'll sort of carve out these times on my schedule. I can't guarantee other times will work, but if these don't work for you in particular instances, um, then we can try to get something that does work for you. So for last class, we were talking about the closed version of the first law, right? That delta E is equal to Q minus W. And I said, we have this general flow chart where we are going to use the first law to find Q, which means that we have to find W's, which we did last class was talking about W is the integral of PDV. Um, but then delta E, we make some assumptions and it becomes mass times the change in the specific internal energy. So then how do we find specific internal energy and the answer is often anyway we use these tables that are in the textbook and that's really what we're going to focus on um, today now in order especially when we're dealing with water or something like it like a refrigerant something that we boil and condense what we really want to do is figure out what the phase is so is it a liquid or is it steam or a vapor or is it some combination of, two, of the two, right? So we'll draw things like temperature versus specific volume and pressure versus specific volume diagrams. We'll draw these vapor domes for water or refrigerants, and we'll need to be able to know what the phase is. And we'll talk about how to do that today. But if it turns out to be a subcooled liquid, at least for now, until we get to the third part of the lecture today, we'll say that um, we'll look in table A5 if it's water. Right. If it's on this line, it's a saturated liquid. That means it's ready to boil, but it's still liquid. Right. So it's at the right pressure and temperature for boiling, but still in the liquid state. If it's above the vapor dome and to the right of the critical point, remember the critical point is sort of the apex or the highest part of the vapor dome over here, then this is a superheated vapor or steam. If it's above the vapor dome and in this region, then we'll want to be on table A4 if we're talking about water. If it's on this red line, then it's a saturated vapor. Again, it's at the right temperature or pressure for boiling, but it's all steam, right? Boiling or condensing, right? Because it could change phase the other way if we're removing heat. Right? And then if we're in the process of boiling or condensing, 
then we could be at some equilibrium point where we're some combination of liquid and vapor. And then we'll use table A2 or A3 if we're talking about water. And that way um, we'll need some other piece of information because temperature and pressure are dependent if we're boiling. So we start to talk about quality in these cases. Quality is defined as the mass fraction of vapor or the mass of vapor divided by the total mass. So what percentage of our mixture is vapor or steam by mass? So it turns out that if we're talking about table A4 or A5, if we're talking about subcooled liquid or if we're talking about superheated vapor, the process that we'll use to fix the state is kind of similar, right? Um, we'll look through these tables, and as we'll see in the example, they're really sort of a table of tables. So each of these subtables are by pressure, and we'll try to find the one that's the right pressure, and then we'll use the other piece of information that we have, maybe temperature, to interpolate, right? So interpolation is just a fancy word for saying that on these tables we have, we have points, and we're gonna assume that all the properties vary linearly between the points that are given on the tables. So if I know, for example, the percentage of the temperature range that I've gone, that's my interpolation factor A, right? So maybe I've gone 25% of the range between the two temperatures on the table. Well, that means I've also have to have gone 25% of the range between the specific internal energy. And again, I think this will probably start to make more sense as we do examples. Right? And that's what we're going to do today. We're going to look at how we find um, data on these tables, right? And it's a lot about interpolation. How do we find the pieces of information that are between set rows on these tables? Right, so again, what we're doing here is we're trying to solve the first law. We're trying to build the tools in our toolbox so we can solve the first law for closed systems. Now here we've already made some assumptions about kinetic energy, potential energy, and spring energy. But if I get to this point, typically what I'd be trying to do in a first law problem is find the work by integrating P over some range of volume then I'm going to have to find what the change in the specific internal energy is multiplied by the mass. That'll give me delta big U, and I'll use that to find Q. But we don't really have a lot of experience finding that change in the specific internal energy yet. Right? So today we're going to talk about strategies of finding that using these thermodynamic tables. Particularly, we're going to talk about water because so much of what we do as mechanical engineers when we're talking about heat engines is boiling water, right? Um, so how do I find the specific internal energy? Like I was saying at the beginning of class, we want to know what the phase is. So when we're talking about water, we need to know, is it liquid water? Is it water vapor? Or is it some combination of liquid water and water vapor, right? And if I know that, then I know which table I can look at, right? And if it's um, single phase, so if it's liquid or vapor, then I'm going to use tables like this, right? And maybe it makes more sense if we go right away to our example over here. So that's the first one in the example. I'm going to try to do it um, here because maybe that gives us a better flavor for what the tables look like. Right. So the first state we're going to look at is state one on this example here. Oh, I don't know why. Why won't it let me pick a color? Okay. Maybe we'll use the PowerPoints. I don't understand why this is not working here. Can I write? All right, well, we'll go back over here. So, sorry about that. So in this first case, 
it tells us we're at 10 megapascals, right? And we're at 400 degrees. Now, maybe I can still go to this table or this page because I can show you what these tables look like, right? So here we want 10 megapascals. So is that here? Right? So if I'm looking at these tables, you see, so table A5, this is for steam. If you look in the textbook or in the tables that we've provided on my courses, what table A5 is, like I said, it's a table consisting of many tables. So first we want to find the right pressure, right? So here we're going to look for, oh, this one's uh, 10 megapascals. Right, so this is for subcooled liquid, but I think our temperature was 400 degrees, right? And that tells us that, oh, we, we can't actually be on this table because 400 degrees isn't here. So instead, I need to look for some table, right? So we can see that these different tables have different um, values on them, right? And if I can't find both pieces of information, then I can't look at, the, at that table. That's not the right place for it. Right, so in this case, we know that we're at 10 megapascals, which is 100 bar, and we're at 400 degrees. So we looked first at the 10 megapascal table as if it was liquid water, but 400 degrees wasn't on that table, right? It stopped at 275 or something, and then it told us that, oh, if we're at 10 megapascals, water boils at 311 degrees. But here we're talking about 400 degrees, so that's bigger than the boiling temperature. That means we must have um, we must have steam, right? Because we're past the boiling temperature. So in this case is pretty straightforward because I found my table, right? So it's at 10 megapascals, right? So so that told me that it was this subtable in table A4. And then now I'm looking for a row on this table that's 400 degrees Celsius, right? So here it tells me 400 degrees. So I look down here and I'm lucky in this case because the temperature is right there on that row, right? So here I can just copy this down. So if it says, I think in the, in the actual example, it, it says find the specific volume and the specific internal energy and all of these properties. But in the lecture, for the sake of time, we're just going to find U because the strategies are the same for all of them, right? So in this case, I just read that off the table. So if I was looking for the specific internal energy in this case, it's right off the table. I don't have to do any math here at all. It's just 2832.4. Does that make sense? Okay. Remember, if you have questions, you can always unmute yourself. Or you can try to type something in the chat. I'll try to keep an eye on that as well. Right, so what happens if we're in between rows, right? That's our next question, right? Then we have to do this thing that we call interpolation, right? This is kind of like maybe you've heard about extrapolating from graphs. That's when you go beyond the last point in your series, right? So this is interpolating. We're guessing a value that's in between two known points on our graph. Right? or in our tables in this case, right? So if I assume that whatever function, so, so the specific internal energy is some function of temperature, it's really nonlinear, but I'm going to pretend that it's linear. And if that's the case, then I know if I've gone, say, 20% of the distance between two temperature values on my table, then I also have to have gone 20% of the difference between two specific internal energy values, right? So in this next part of the problem, it says we're at one bar, right? Remember a bar is, it's kind of like the metric equivalent of, of one atmosphere. So one atmosphere is um, generally quoted to be something like 101.3 kilopascals. But in the metric system, we don't like that. We like nice round numbers, right? So one bar is 100 kilopascals, right? So if I asked you, if, so, and remember, the boiling temperature of something like water is dependent on the pressure. So as the pressure gets higher, 
right? That means that the atmosphere is pushing those water molecules closer together. So the temperature has to get higher for them to separate into vapor, right? But because you're a human and you live on Earth, probably somewhere near sea level, you probably know what the boiling temperature of water is, right? So around atmospheric pressure, or at atmospheric pressure, the boiling temperature of water is 100 degrees Celsius, right? So this is about atmospheric pressure. It's a little bit less. So the boiling temperature here would be a little bit less than 100. But in this case, we're talking about water that's at one bar around an atmosphere and 410 degrees. That's much higher than the boiling temperature. So this must be steam, right? So I look at table A4, which is my steam table. And like you see here, it's a table A4 is a, is a table of tables. So I want to find the table that has the right pressure value at the top, right? So here I'm looking for one bar, right? So one bar and I'm looking for 410 degrees, right? So in this case, I know it's the right hand table on this slide, but I'm a little bit, I'm trying to find specific internal energy and I'm not quite as lucky as I was last time because last time it was right on a row and now it's somewhere in between. Right? So I know that my specific internal energy is going to be somewhere in between 2968-ish right? and 3032.6. Right? But where is it in between? Right? So now the assumption that I make is that specific internal energy varies linearly with temperature. And I'm at 410 degrees. So I want to do this linear interpolation, right? So here, this T min becomes 400. T max becomes this next value on my table, 440, right? And T is 410, right? So I've gone a quarter of the way in my temperature range. That must mean because it's linear, I've gone a quarter of the run, so I must have also gone a quarter of the rise, right? So mathematically, I define this interpolation factor, which I call A or B or some other letter, right? The interpolation factor, I always set it up like this. So it's the thing, the, the property that I know that I'm looking for, right? So this is my temperature, in this case, 410, minus the minimum temperature in my range, that's 400, divided by the total range, which is T max minus T min, or in this case, 440 minus 400. That same value of A has to be equal to the specific internal energy at the temperature I'm looking for, minus the minimum specific internal energy in my range, divided by the total range of the specific internal energy here. Does that make sense? Okay, so in this case, you might be able to do the, the math at least to find A in your head, right? Because it's going to be 410 minus 400, that's 10, right? Divided by 440 minus 400, that's 40, right? So it's one quarter or 25%, right? So if I've gone 25% of this temperature range, then I must also have gone 25% of this specific internal energy range. Right, so A is 0 0.25, right? So then here I write out that, um, I wish, let's see if my pen works in, uh, so if this is true, let's see if it works in here, oh good, right? Then this must mean, if I multiply this out, right, this means U as a function of T minus U min, is equal to A times U max minus U min, right? Or that U of T, the thing that I'm looking for, is equal to U min plus A, oops, A times U max minus U min. Right? And I work this out. This is 0 
and I get these values from the table, and this is the thing that I didn't know. So if I was looking at this particular system of equations, right, when I'm trying to find, I didn't know A initially, but I knew T, T min, T max, and T min. Here, I don't know A, and I don't know U of T, but I know U min and U max, right? So I have two equations and two unknowns. So I use my first equation to find A, and then I put A into this equation, and I get this, and then I use this equation to find U of T. Does that make sense? Yep. Did you have a question, Jules? Yep. If I multiplied u min by 1.25, because it's 25% of the range and not 25% of u min, yeah, right? right? So, so I don't think that'll give you the correct answer. Right? So that's how we do um, these types of problems, right? So, so here I can do this and I get this number, right? But again, it's a little bit less important how we get the number, a little bit more important, or, or it's a little less important what the number is, a little bit more important how we do the process, especially early on, like until the first midterm. What happens is on the first midterm, I'm, I'm more interested in how you're getting these numbers Right? And then the second midterm a little bit less and the third midterm a little bit more. So we'll learn a little bit more. So you really want to demonstrate your understanding of this when we get to, um, you know, to the first midterm. Let's go back and see if I can. If I close this. Because I'd like to be able to work over here if I can. I don't know why. Okay, we will continue. All right, so I'm going to skip that example. Well, maybe this is the next one to do, right? So this one becomes a little trickier now, right? So this is, so we did this one, right? It gets a little harder when you don't have... So that was a case where we, the, we had a table for the pressure, but we didn't have a row for the temperature. It's also possible to get to a point where you don't have a table for the pressure and you don't have a row for the temperature. Right? This is kind of the worst case scenario when you're doing this kind of interpolation. Right? So we know that in our table of tables, we don't have the right table, right? So that's not great. Um, and we don't have the right temperature, right? So I know it's going to be somewhere in between these four variables or these four numbers here, but I don't know where, right? So we have to do what we call double interpolation because now we have to do that same interpolation both with temperature and with pressure. And even though we call it double interpolation, as you'll see, we end up doing it um, three times, right? If I was drawing this out, I know that U is a function of T, right? And I have two different lines here, right? Two different functions, one at P1 and one at P2, right? And I know that, um, you know, this makes some kind of shape and I know my final value has to be somewhere inside that shape there, right? So I have some temperature that's between T min and T max and some pressure that's in between P1 and P2, right? So now I have to interpolate twice and I have two different potential strategies when I look at this graphically. I can do either of these two variables first, right? So I could interpolate with temperature first, right? And then I have my interpolation factor A. 
And then really what I do is I do that same interpolation that we talked about in the last example, but I do it at both pressures. Right now, it's like I've made a table of my own at the right temperatures or a row on both of those tables, right? That's the right temperature. And then I have to interpolate with pressure in between those two values. So I need another interpolation factor, B, right? And then I can interpolate between those two pressures, right? And that'll give me the value that I'm looking. Right? If I was doing this in a tabular form, right, what I really want is this kind of, you know, this three by three matrix over here, right? So here, it's like the corners are what I know. And it's a bit like, I don't know if you ever watched the old game show Hollywood Squares, it had like Whoopi Goldberg on it, right? And you're trying to get to the center square, right? That's where the answer is in here, right? And if I'm interpolating with temperature first, right? Then what I'm doing is I'm using A to find this middle row, right? So basically I'm getting a row at my different pressures, but it's at the right temperature. And then I use the interpolation factor B to get to the center here, to get to the answer. So I don't need to figure out all of these nine squares here. I just have to get to the middle. Right? So I can either go vertically first with temperature and then once with pressure. Right? Or I could do my second option, which would be to integrate with P first. Right? So if I integrate first with pressure, graphically, that looks like this. Remember, we called our interpolation factor for pressure B. Right? So I'm going to find these two intermediate points. Right, so that's at that given those temperatures that are above and below the, the temperatures I'm looking for. Now I'm making like a new table that's at the right pressure, right? But it's only gonna be three rows, right? And then I can interpolate between those two new values with my second interpolation factor, A, right? And that'll get me to the center as well. So graphically, it looks like this, but if I'm making a table, which is probably what I'd suggest you do if you're crunching the numbers, right? Is now I'm first going to interpolate with pressure, right? And then what I get is this new column in the table that's at the pressure that I'm looking for, right? And then I use my interpolation factor A to find that middle point, the point that I actually care about. Now, how do I choose, right? What's the right order to do this in? Or is there kind of a, a heuristic um, that I can use? So what I tend to look for is double interpolation. Um, I'm really hoping I don't have to do on an exam because it takes some time. But if I have to do it, I'm going to hope that one of my two interpolation factors is 0.5. Because any time one of those interpolation factors is 0.5, it means that the value is halfway in between the numbers on the table, right? Which is the same as doing the average, right? Um, and that average calculation is fairly quick to do, right? A plus B over two, right? Or maybe I shouldn't say A plus B because we're using, right? So, so the two numbers, right? I just take the average, right? So in this case, we're lucky, right? Because if I look for my interpolation factor for P, right, that's not halfway in between these two values, right? 0.7 bar and one bar, 0.8 bar is one third, right, of the way in between, right? But my temperature value 220 is smack in the middle of 200 and 240. So one of my interpolation factors here is 0.5, right? So in that case, um, I would, in this case, I would interpolate with temperature first because it's easier and I have to do that one twice. And then I would interpolate with pressure. So what does this look like? Right, so here I've, uh, I've listed my value. So this is the 0.7 bar, this is one bar, right? And 200, here's a row for 200 degrees and a row for um, 240. 
So what I did was I took these two numbers, 2659 and 2719, and they go in the corners here, right? In these two numbers, 2658 and 2718, they go in the corners over here, right? So that sets us up, right, in our three by three matrix that we're trying to get to the middle of, right? Now, I want to use the interpolation factor A first, right? Because that's halfway in between here and halfway in between there, right? So now I'm first going to find the midpoint between here. So I'm going to do my interpolation, right? So halfway in between there, if I take the, um, if I take the average, then I get 2689, right? So that goes up here. Similarly, I want to take the average of these numbers and put it in over here, right? So now... I have these values, right? Now, if this was an exam, I'd want to stop here and say, oh, 2689 and 2688, they're pretty close together. You know, and I know it's a third, and this is, they're like one apart, right? So I could just subtract 0.3 or something from over here, or just take half, in the, but I want to tell me that, like, hey, Dr. Schertzer, I'm running low on time. Um, I know that the interpolation factor is 0.3, but I'm just going to take a number halfway in between because these two numbers are close enough together. Right? But if they were further apart, I'd still want to do um, the difference here. right? And it gets a little weird when we're interpolating with pressure because this is still U at P min, right? Even though it's the bigger value, right? So um, in my equations... This is the minimum value in my equations, even though it's the higher number, because it happens at the lower pressure. Right? So we're still only going a third of the difference here. So my number should be closer to 2689.2 than 2688.3. Right? So in this case, it's 2688.9. So double interpolation, it's funny, in this class, um, it's usually not the math that's hard in this class. It's usually the concepts. Um, none of the individual components of the math here for interpolation or double interpolation are complicated. But sometimes it's just the, you know, the mechanics of doing it, especially something like this that's pretty monotonous. So it's pretty easy to get, uh, you know, I don't know about you. I'm really good at putting numbers into my calculator wrong. So, um, you know, it's easy to get to the wrong answer, which is why you want to, you know, do as much symbolically as you can. Show me what you're doing on a test, right? Because ultimately that's your job is to demonstrate your understanding when you're, when you're doing a test, right? So show me what you're doing. Because then even if your answer is wrong, I can still give you most of the credit, right? So this is true for any property, Right, so we talked about doing this for specific internal energy, but I could have done all the same things for specific volume, that little V on the table, or little H and little S. We don't really know exactly what those are yet or why we might need them, but I can use these same strategies for those other properties as well. Right, and again, if you're looking for, um, you know, when you're looking over how to do this for the homework, you can either pop into office hours tomorrow. We'll use the same link as we do for the classes. Um, but you can also, um, you know, check out these examples that are that are posted either in my notes or you can look at something like the thermal shorts or something to get uh, examples of how to do these things. Right. So that's what we do if we're single phase, if we're liquid or if we're vapor. Um, but what do we do if we're two phase? Right. So if we're some combination of liquid and vapor, right? Then we have two different tables, table A2 or table A3. The difference is going to be what's the variable we have on the left. So both of these tables are for two-phase mixtures or the textbook will call them saturated water, right? Some liquid vapor mixture, right? Here we want to know what quality is, right? <clears throat> so if we knew temperature and quality, we wouldn't use this table. We would use table A2. But if we knew pressure and quality, we'd use this table because pressure is nicely on the left. Right? Now we have a new equation, a quality equation, which ultimately looks very much like our, um, 
interpolation equation, the way that we're teaching it, which is why I try to teach interpolation the way that I do, because then it's really just the same thing as quality, right? So here, I'm using Z just as a placeholder for any of these, specific volume or specific internal energy or little h, specific enthalpy, or little s, specific entropy. So that's what Z is. It's just a placeholder for any of these variables. Because really, all this is saying is, I have some linear combination of liquid and vapor, right? And the quality tells me how much is vapor, right? So then I can use this equation. Um, so let's say I was trying to find specific internal energy, right? And then this would be UF plus X, how much is vapor, times UG minus UF, right? Um, in the case of enthalpy, which we'll use a lot more once we get past the first exam, they also have this variable called HFG. HFG is just HG minus HF. They're trying to save you a step on your calculator. It's one less thing to mess up, right? Um, we use that more for open systems, so we don't really use it before we get to the second um, part of the class. So what does this table mean? This one's a nicer version of the table. Um, so remember, we have our vapor dome drawn here, right? And the leftmost line, this is our saturated liquid line, right? All of the properties associated with the saturated liquid get a subscript of F. I don't know why F is the subscript for liquids, right? And then the subscript for the saturated vapor is G, I kind of remember that because it's it's like a gas, right? Although I would call it a vapor, right? They all get subscripts of G, right? And remember, H gets this FG, which just means HG minus HF. One thing you got to be careful of in this particular um, table is when it gives us the saturated liquid specific volumes. Remember, specific volume is one over the density, right? Or it's the volume divided by the mass. Here, it looks like the values here are one, but all of these values have been multiplied by 10 to the three or a thousand, right? So to get the actual specific volume, you have to divide all these numbers by a thousand. The way I try to remember this in the metric system, um, the density of liquid water is almost always about a thousand kilograms per meter cubed. The specific volume has to be the reciprocal of that. So the specific volume should always be around one over a thousand if we're talking about a liquid. And so that's one thing we got to be careful of when we look at this, right? Because um, it can mess you up if, if you think that's one instead of one over a thousand. Right? So here's one example, um, right? We could have a pressure of 0.8 bar and a quality of 0.9, right? So what this tells us, right? So 0.8 bar. So because, first, because it tells me the quality, I only talk about quality when I'm under the vapor dome. So anytime you get a problem and it tells you the quality, that means you look on either table A2 or A3. Because the other piece of information we have here is the pressure, I go to table A3 because it has nice round pressures on the left. Right? What this means as I read left to right, this means that if I have water and it's boiling at 0.8 bar, remember that's somewhat less than one atmosphere, this means, that means the temperature is going to be 93.5 as long as phase change is happening. This tells me that if I'm at 0.8 bar, the boiling temperature of water is 93.5 degrees Celsius. Right? So if I know, so here, if I told you that the pressure was 0.8 and water was boiling, you can't fix the state because you don't know how much is liquid or vapor, but you could tell me the temperature right away, right? So now here, if I'm trying to find the specific internal energy at 0.8 bar, it's somewhere between 391 and a half, right? And about 2,500. Right? Notice there's a big difference between these values. This is, again, why my grandmother would have told me a watch pot never boils. You have to put a lot of energy in to go from liquid to vapor. 
right? So I'm somewhere in between these two numbers. And because I'm mostly vapor here, I'm expecting to get a number closer to 2,500 than to 391, right? Because it's mostly vapor in my mixture, right? So I know that it's somewhere in between those two numbers, but I don't know exactly where, right? So I want to do the math here, right? So I go into, this is, if I was graphing this out, quality goes from zero to one, right? So at UF, my quality is zero. At, at UG, my quality is one, right? Here, I mean, I could have drawn this over here, right? Because my quality is 0.9. So it's got to be close to up here, right? Um, and now I can do the math, right? So if I've gone, the nice thing about this is I don't even have to figure out my interpolation factor because quality is my interpolation factor. It's already some number between zero and one, right? The percentage of the range of quality that I went, right? So I get X basically for free off the bat, right? And now I can get X from my equation Again, I separate this out. So X is also equal to U at that quality minus UF, which is like my U at the minimum value of X, divided by UG, which is U at the maximum value of X, minus UF, which is U at the minimum value of X, right? So this is why I teach linear interpolation in the single phase case in the, in the way that I do, because then it collapses. It ends up being really the same thing as the quality equation, it's just a little harder to find the interpolation factor A than it is because sometimes we're just given X, right? So this would be my equation, UF plus X times UG minus UF, right? I know UF and UG, I just read those off the table. It told me X was 0.9, right? So I can put those numbers into my equation, right? So 391 and a half goes here. And then my second term is 0.9. That's my quality. It gets dragged down in here. And then I take UG minus UF. I put that into my calculator. And provided I didn't make a mistake, I get 2,288.1. I can do sort of a sense check here. I get the right units, right? Because it's internal energy, right? So it's kilojoules per kilogram. Um, and... I'm closer to UG than I am to UF. To me, that makes sense because I've gotten mostly water vapor, right? So I'm 90% water vapor. So I should be closer to the water vapor value, UG, than I am to the um, liquid water value, UF, right? So this kind of conceptually makes sense to me. So this is what I do if I have pressure and quality, right? So if it's two-phase pressure and quality. I like when they give me quality because I automatically know what table to look at. If they give me temperature and quality, it's basically the same process. It's just that instead of looking on table A3, right? So when I go back here, table A3 had pressure in the leftmost column, nice round numbers of temperature, and then it tells me the pressure, or right, nice round numbers of pressure, and it tells me the boiling temperatures at that pressure. Table A2, it has nice round values of temperature on the left. And then it tells me if I was at 85 degrees and water is boiling, oh, then my pressure must be 0.58-ish bars. Right? In this case, it tells me the temperature is 100 degrees Celsius and I have a quality of 0.25. Again, because we're humans and we mostly live at around atmospheric pressure, if the temperature is 100 degrees Celsius and water is boiling. You already know we're at one atmosphere. So the pressure is about 101.3 or 0.4 kilopascals. But that's not what it asked us, right? It asked us for the specific internal energy, right? So in this case, right, we're looking between 419-ish and 2506.5. And now, because quality is only 0.25, I know that I should be closer to the liquid value than I am to the, um, to the vapor value, right? But it's the same equation. I still use the quality equation, right? I get that um, U of X is equal to UF 
plus x times the difference between ug and uf. Right? And when I put that together, I get um, about 941 kilojoules per kilogram. Right? Again, I can look at this and say, like, does it make sense? Well, the units are right. It's in kilojoules per kilogram, right? And it's closer to 418 than it is to 2,500, right? So again, it sort of makes sense, right? And I know I went through this one faster, but the math is the same as it is for, um, for the other case that we just did. We're going to do a bonus one here because I want to show you the confusion that can sometimes happen when you're looking at these two-phase tables. Your spidey sense has always got to start tingling when you're uh, talking about specific volumes. So here, right, we're looking at specific volumes, right? And it tells me that I'm at 100 degrees Celsius, but my specific volume is 0.9. So the first thing that I want to do is say, is it a two-phase mixture, right? It's only a two-phase mixture if I'm at a specific volume that's in between UF and UG, right? So usually what I do when I have a full classroom, right, is I'll ask for a show of hands and, and ask how many people, like, who thinks that this is in between UF and UG, right? So is, is 0.9 in between UF and UG, right? And often a lot of people say, well, no, it's not in between those two numbers. Like I'm not a mathematician, but I know that 0.9 isn't between 1.04 and 1.67, right? And that's exactly what it looks like. And if you do it too quickly, that's what you're gonna end up with and the answer will be wrong, right? Because this value here, UF, is not 1.04 right? That's UF times a thousand, right? So this is not one, it's one over a thousand. It's almost zero, right? So even though it doesn't look like it at first glance, 0.9 is between UF or VF and VG in this case. So what do we do, right? This I like it when it's a two-phase mixture, but my favorite is when they tell me the quality. But in this case, they didn't tell me the quality. So that makes this problem a little bit harder, right? Because first, I'm going to have to use the fact that I know the specific volume to find the quality. And then I'm going to use the quality I find to get the specific internal energy. The good news is it's still the same quality equation. This equation for quality works for any of the properties on that table that are not pressure and temperature, right? So it's true for little v, little u, little h, and little s, right? So here, where before we were using sort of this version of the equation because we already knew x, in this case, I know v of x. So I prefer to use this equation to get x. Right, so here I'm going to choose this version of the equation, right, and that's going to give me a value for x. Right? So again, we got to be careful to use this divided by 1,000 when I'm putting that into Vf. And if you're really in a hurry on, a, on an exam or something, you probably, if you just took V of t right, divided by... Uh, VG here, then it's just really be V of X. Um, you'd get almost the right answer because in this case, one over a thousand is much smaller than 0.9 and it's much smaller than 1.67. Right? So we're about halfway in between, right? And then when I'm now that I know X, now I can go back and solve this equation because now, um, I couldn't solve this equation initially because I didn't know u of x and I didn't know x, right? So I needed this equation to find x. I put it in here, and then I can find that the specific internal energy is about halfway in between 1,463.
anybody have any questions about how we fixed these particular states? So when we come back after the break, we're going to do another example where we go through and we fix maybe six different states, right? And we're also going to start to talk about how to draw um, the PV diagrams and TV diagrams because that's, um, that can be pretty confusing. So um, we'll maybe take a break for five minutes. We'll come back at 7.25 and we'll get going on that second example. And I'm going to try to figure out um, how I can use my pen on that example. So I will see you in five minutes. Thanks. Okay. Okay, so I think my problem here was that uh, those other things were um, uh, the version of Word was an old version of Word, right? So, um, so I updated the version now works, right? Now here, there's some preamble here. Um, <clears throat> it says, that, hey, you're working at a nuclear power plant and uh, your boss wants you to find values for specific internal energy in all of these um, particular states, right? So we're going to go do that. Now, the good news is for each of these states, we have two pieces of information, right? So we need two independent intensive properties to fix the state, right? So this first one, it's at 460 degrees and 80 bar, right? So I need to figure out I like to draw TV diagrams if I have a choice, right? Now here, because we're talking about water, I'm going to draw a vapor dome. Now, what do I know here? Now I want to draw a constant pressure line, right? My constant pressure line is going to be 480 bar. Now a TV diagram, a constant pressure line goes up. And then across the vapor dome, and then up again, right? Now, what this tells me is that if I'm at 80 bar, water boils at 295 degrees Celsius, approximately, right? So this is T sat. That's where it crosses the vapor dome, and that equals 295, approximately, right? But we're talking about 460 degrees, right? So, for you know, 460 is going to be somewhere up like this, right? And that's going to be over here. Actually, you know, it's even higher than that, and I'll show you why. So, if we look at one of these two phase tables, this is one of the two phase tables. Um, does the other one have the... I don't think it goes all the way to the top. I think that the highest temperature of the vapor dome is approximately 375 degrees. Um, but we might want to check that in, uh, in the tables, right? So 460 is up here somewhere, right? That means that my state point, if I was drawing it on a TV diagram, would be up here, right? I find it a little bit trickier to draw PV diagrams, but if I was drawing a PV diagram, the process would be about the same, right? I would draw my vapor dome because we're talking about water and not an ideal gas, so I need a vapor dome. And now I need a constant temperature line, right? Now, here I know that my pressure is something that cuts through the vapor dome. So I know my 80 bar goes like this, goes through the vapor dome. But if I drew a constant temperature line, which goes down and then across and then down, this would be for 295. And see how they're coincident under the vapor dome? Now what happens is as the temperature goes up, this line shifts up, right? So 460 is a line that doesn't go under the vapor dome. So this is going to come over here somewhere. So the good news is when I drew both of these, there's some agreement. The points don't have to be in exactly the same place, but they have to be in the same part of the graph, 
in both of these cases, I see that I'm expecting this to be a superheated vapor. So I go to table A4, right? And that makes sense because if I go to table A4, I see 80 bar and 460 is not quite on the table, but I see that it's in between here, right? So now I want to get, so I have to interpolate, right? So I define my interpolation factor A. That's going to be T minus T min over T max minus T min, right? That's the temperature that I want, 460, minus the minimum temperature on the, that's 440, the minimum temperature in my range, divided by 480 minus 440. This one you probably have already done in your head as I'm writing this down, right? It's okay if you haven't. This is 20 over 40, right? Which is 0 0.5, right? But A is also equal to U at T minus U at T min. I'm just going to say N and X because then it saves me some pen strokes. This is going to be U T max minus U T min. Right? So if I look at this part of the equation, right? So if I look at this system of equations, the thing that I know, the things that I know, right, are U at T min, U of X, or T max, U at T min, right? I know T, T min, T max, T min. The things that I don't know are A and U T, right? So I use sort of the right-hand part of this equation to find A, which was 0.5. And I'm going to use the left-hand part to find UT. That's going to be equal to, or I won't skip the step, UT minus UT min is equal to A times U of T max minus U of T min. Right, this is going to be u of t is equal to u of t min plus a times u of t max minus u of t min. Doing it this way always works. But this case is it's a bit of a special case because any time that a or b or whatever interpolation factor you have is half, then you're also halfway in between these two numbers. You could just take the average, right? Um, I'm for the interest of brevity here. I'm not going to solve this numerically, but I could, right? So here, right? This is going to be this is uh, u of t min is twenty nine forty six point seven. U of t max is thirty twenty five point seven, and a is 0.5, right? So again, if you want to see this worked out numerically, you can either download the notes or check out the thermal shorts or something. Does that make sense? So that's how we do this first one, right? This is a good one too, because any time, just like this one, where we have a temperature and a pressure, we're not sure if we can fix the state because the temperature and the pressure may not be independent, right? But in this case, because we're not under the vapor dome, they were independent, right? So now we're gonna move on to state two, right? Again, I'm gonna to wanna to try to draw a TV and a PV diagram because the fluid that we're talking about is water. I need a vapor dome on both of these diagrams. These are just sketches. You notice that sometimes, uh, you know, in the notes, it's like a nice scale dra drawing. You don't have to do that, right? Mm -hmm. Obviously, I'm not going to expect you to draw like a log plot freehand, right? Um, because we won't be reading them graphically at least till the very end of the class, right? Which is a fun thing we can do with air conditioners. So here we know that the pressure is 7 bar and that the quality is something. Right? Almost one. Right? So the nice thing here is I know automatically that my 
I'm under the vapor dome, right? And because I know the pressure, I'm going to go to table A3. I like A3 for pressure because it's got pressure as the first column, and these are nice round numbers. So I'm going to take this row. What it also tells me is that any time I'm boiling, if I'm under the vapor dome, then at 7 bar, my temperature is 165. So here, I know my temperature is 7 bar, which cuts through the vapor dome, right? Constant pressure line goes up and to the right, right? But then I also know that the temperature here is 165, right? Now, also, I know that the quality is right around 1, so I'm going to be pretty close to that red line there. If I was asked to draw this on a PV diagram, here I know my pressure is 7 bar. We'll pretend this is the horizontal line that I'm drawing here, right? This is 7 bar. If I wanted to draw a temperature line, this goes down and to the right, but it's coincident under the vapor dome, right? So this is 165 degrees Celsius, right? And again, my state point is somewhere over here, close to a quality of one, right? So I'm trying to find U as a function of quality, right? I know that anytime I'm looking for anything as a function of quality, I take UF plus X times UG minus u f right or if i was trying to find quality this is the same thing right as saying x is equal to u minus u f over u g minus u f i'm sorry my subscripts look kind of similar there right now in this case i can see maybe i won't use uh, right so for seven bar Here's UF, and here's UG. So I have those two values. I can plug those in over here. I don't know why that happens sometimes. And then my quality is given, so I just plug that in. So I have everything here. And if this was an exam, or if it's a multiple choice test, right? So if it was a multiple choice test, I know I could automatically eliminate any number that's out that's that's not between 696.44 and 2572.5. And because my quality is almost one, I'm probably gonna eliminate anything that's not, you know, really close to 2572.5. Right? If it's a multiple choice test. Right? So even though this can be cumbersome if you're doing the math, a lot of times, if you sort of understand what you're doing, you can eliminate a lot of the values. And maybe you can just be left with one. You don't even have to do the math. Right? Now, again, you know, in the interest of saving time, uh, maybe if we have some time at the end, I can go back and show you what the numbers are. But this is the process. Does that make sense? So now we're going to do state three. State three is another one we can be a little bit worried about because I know to fix a state, I need two independent intensive properties. In the last case, when I had pressure and quality, those are always independent and they're always intensive. Here I have intensive properties, but they're only independent if we're not under the vapor dome, right? So here, I again, well, maybe I'll go back and use those other graphs from over here, right? So here, my temperature versus specific volume graph, I'm at the same pressure, right? Seven bar. <clears throat> and what I found out was that when water is boiling at seven bar, it boils at 165 degrees. But now we're at 440 degrees. 440 doesn't even cut through the vapor dome, it's so high. So that makes me think 
that I'm at a superheated vapor over here. Right? So this would be my state point three is somewhere over there. I think it makes more sense to do on a TV diagram. I always get a little bit confused when I'm drawing these PV diagrams. But what I know is that when I drew this 165 degree line, it cut through the vapor dome across that same line as the seven bar line. Now I know that 440, that temperature doesn't even go through the vapor dome. So it's always above the vapor dome but it still moves down as I move left to right. And then this here is state three, also in the superheated vapor region, right? So in both cases, even though the points aren't in exactly the same spot, they're still in the same region. If you ever do this and you find that you're finding the same point on these two diagrams and they're in different regions. They're telling you that the phase is different. That means you've done something wrong, right? So you got to sit back and think, or you can go back and look at different um, tables. In this case, if I didn't know where this was, I would look on the two phase tables, right? And in this case, I was already at this table right? And saw that, oh, at seven bar, water boils at 165 degrees. I know if I'm above the boiling temperature, I must have boiled all the water. So it's got to be vapor. Even if I didn't know that, right? I would go, this is the superheated vapor table. Oops. And I wouldn't go to this part of the graph because that's 80 bar. I'd have to go over here, right? For seven bar notice that here it's telling me water boils at 164.97 degrees i guess whoever made this table um you know wanted to be a little bit more um you know precise than over here but that's maybe faux precision that's pretty pretty precise right so but these numbers are the same 165 and 164.97 right so notice all the numbers in this column are bigger than 165 Right? And since my number is bigger than 165, this must be the right table. I'm lucky that 440 is right on a line here, so I don't even have to interpolate. Right here, I can just say that U3 is equal to 3,026.6 kilojoules per kilogram. So in a way, this was the easiest one because we didn't have to do the interpolation. But it's tricky because we need to figure out what the phase is first, right? And even if you don't, if you don't get it from drawing the diagrams, which I think is a good way to go about doing it, but if you feel like you can't exactly do it that way, you could just look on these tables and eventually you'll get to a point where you can, you can find the property there, right? But that's going to be a little more time consuming. Um, and oftentimes on exams, we'll ask you to draw things like PV or TV diagrams. And in the homework, we'll ask you to do that too. All right. Now, the next one is another nice one because here we're given quality. Anytime we're given quality, we know we're under the vapor dome. Last time we were given quality, they told us the pressure and the quality, which meant that I looked on table A3 where the pressure was in nice round numbers on the left. This time, they give me temperature and quality. So I'm going to look for the table that has temperatures in nice round numbers on the left. That's table A2 when we're talking about water. Again, I'm going to want to draw TV and PV diagrams. And again, because I'm talking about water, I need to draw vapor domes on my TV and PV diagrams. Now, what I know is that the temperature is 40 degrees. 
40 degrees cuts through the vapor dome pretty at a pretty low point right because we know that uh, at one atmosphere water boils at 100 degrees so if water is boiling at four degrees it must mean that the pressure is pretty low because it's easier for those water molecules to separate right so there's less sort of atmosphere pushing those water molecules together so here my pressure is lower than one atmosphere here my pressure is what what did we say 40 degrees so it's 0 0.07 ish bar right or seven kilopascals again just like the the last quality one the quality is pretty high so i'm expecting my state four to be pretty close to that saturated vapor line Now, if I'm drawing my PV diagram, what I know is the temperature, right? So now I know that the temperature cuts through the vapor dome, right? And that it cuts through the vapor dome at that low pressure, right? So here, I'm going to have a constant temperature line that looks like this. This is my 40 degree line, right? And the pressure associated with that 40 degrees is 0 0.7 bar. My state point 4 is close to the red line because my quality is pretty high. Does that make sense? This is great. I love it when they tell me the quality. Because when they tell me the quality, that means I can use my quality equation. I know that u of x is equal to u f plus x times u g minus u f right this is all in this case at the temperature that's given right so this is also at the temperature that's given so here i want to come over here you know use my gray pen right and i'll say oh i'm at 40 degrees so this is u f and this is UG. This is a thing that you can mess up sometimes. You know, if you're doing it fast, especially on an exam, um, maybe you pick from the wrong row, which is, again, why you want to show the symbolic part of the solution first. If you just jump to the answer and you don't show me what you're doing, even if you get it right, you haven't demonstrated your understanding. But especially if you get it wrong, there's no way I can help you. Because you just wrote down a number, and the number, if it's wrong, I, I have no idea how you got that number. And even if it's right, it's hard to give you credit for it, because you have to demonstrate your understanding. right? That's your job in a test. Right? So here, I know UF, I know UG, and I know UF, and X is given. Right? So here, I'm going to expect my number U of X it's going to be close to UG, right? It's not exactly going to be equal to UG, right? Because it's, you know, if I looked at this in my head, you know, this is like, this range is only something like 2200. So it's going to be something like 220 less than this. So it's going to be something like 2220, right? But, uh, but you got to do the math to figure out what the actual number is, right? But again, if you were running short on time, you could just write something like this, right? If you do the whole system, the whole problem symbolically, which I'm always going to encourage, especially you'll see this more and more as we get closer to the exam, you know, do as much of the problem symbolically as you can um, because that's demonstrating your understanding, right? That's, you know, you get... I don't know, maybe 70% of the benefit of the, of the points, right, is showing that you know how to do the problem, right? And the good news is, for these closed first law problems, or when you're fixing, you know, the process is almost always the same, right? Now, it gets to be different when it's this choose-your-own-adventure, how do you find the value of you, what's the right phase, right? But symbolically, the answers are usually pretty close to the same, right? So do as much as you can symbolically first. Next, we move to state 
five. State five, this is great because not only do they give me quality, but the quality is zero. And when the quality is zero and the quality is one, if it's one of those two cases, that's like almost the best solution you can have, right? Or the best option that you can have, right? So the first thing we want to do is, well, let's, because we already drew, because the temperature is the same, we already drew our TV diagrams here and our PV diagrams, right? The only difference in this state is that the quality is equal to zero. Now, remember, what quality means is it's the mass of vapor divided by the mass total, right? Or the mass of vapor divided by the mass of the vapor plus the mass of the liquid, right? But if the mass of, if quality is zero, it's because the mass of the vapor is zero, right? So that means, yeah, we're at the right temperature and pressure for boiling, but we're, we're all liquid, right? That means we're right on, I don't know why it keeps erasing like that. That means we're right on, see, it does it again. We're right on this uh, blue line here, right? That's where our state point is. If the quality was one, then we would be right on the red line. Right? Now, this is a step, a step that you can skip in the future, right? but I'm not going to skip the step here. Right? So here we're at 40 degrees again. Right? I know that U of a given quality is equal to Uf plus X times Ug minus Uf. Right? But in this case... The quality is equal to zero. That means this whole term here is equal to zero, right? Which means that U of a quality zero is just equal to UF, which in this case is equal to 167.56 kilojoules per kilogram. Does that make sense? If we had the case where um, it was the same thing or a similar thing, right, that u of x was equal to uf plus x times ug minus uf, right? But let's say in that case, x was equal to 1. If x is equal to 1, then this is going to be uf plus ug minus uf and those two terms cancel out and that's just ug right u of one right so anytime your quality is zero you can just take the value for the saturated liquid so whether that's vf or uf or hf or sf you just take that number Right? Anytime the quality is 1, that means you're fully on the other side of the range, which means you can just take VG or UG or HG or SG. Right? So those are um, kind of some of my favorite cases because they're real straightforward. Right? Um, so I like it when they tell me quality. I like it even better when the quality is 0 or 1. Right, so now we've gone through five of these states. Let's look at the sixth one. This one is a little bit different. Right? So here we're at 80 bar and H. We don't really know why we would use H, but it's a property that's on the tables. Um, we know that the value of H is equal to about 182. So if I was going to draw, so the first thing that I do, if I don't know where to draw what the property is, is I'm going to look first at the two phase tables, right? So here, if I draw TV and PV diagrams, Uh, 
I'm going to draw my saturated liquid line over here. You don't have to use different colors. I always encourage students uh, to bring uh, colored pencils. Or in Canada, we called them pencil crayons. But I think when I say that, people look at me funny. So just like uh, in Canada, we call macaroni and cheese craft dinner. Because uh, what happened when I was, I don't know, maybe in my teens, um, Canada passed a law when they were talking about food that if you list the ingredients, you have to list them in order of, um, you know, uh, concentration by mass. So they used to call it cheese and macaroni, right? But there's more macaroni than there is cheese. So, you know, instead of changing it to macaroni and cheese, I guess they called it craft dinner. Part of me thinks that maybe um, it's because there's no actual cheese in there. Um, this is the same thing. Uh, so I knew a guy who worked for uh, a company that made um, a product that has um, the word cheese in it, but it's not spelled as cheese. That means that uh, they kind of get away from this rule because there's no actual cheese in there, or there doesn't have to be, right? And it was sort of inflation proof, he said, because what would happen is as the price of cheese went up, there was some cheese in there, but as the price of cheese went up, they would reduce the amount of cheese in the product and increase the amount of uh, other stuff, not cheese in the product, but they could keep the name the same, right? So in this case, we have a pressure of 80 bar, right? So here for 80 bar, we see that if it was a two-phase mixture, right? If I'm trying to draw an 80 bar line on this graph, it's going to cut through the vapor dome. And the temperature at which it's going to cut through the vapor dome is 295 degrees. Point one. Right. Similarly, if I draw a constant, right, if I draw my 80 bar line over here, this is 80 bar, right, it's going to have a temperature that goes down into the, this is 295.1 degrees. Now, before, when we had quality or something, we knew pretty, pretty close to whether or not it was in, in this range, right? We could check that out. But here, we can't check it out directly. But if this was two-phase, then um, here we know H, right? So H would be less than HG, but greater than HF. So if I'm not sure whether this is going to be two-phase, or saturated liquid, or superheated vapor, the first thing I want to do is check the two-phase table, right? Because in the two-phase table, it's going to tell me, if it's not two-phase, it's going to tell me whether or not it's vapor or it's liquid, right? So if this is superheated vapor, then Hg is going to be less than H, right? So if H is bigger than Hg, then it's superheated vapor, right? And if it's a subcooled liquid, then um, H is going to be less than HF, right? So it's like I'm trying to see, is the H in between these two values, or is it over here, or is it back here? So now I look at my H values. The, there is a little bit of a tricky thing here. They give us HFG, and they do it to be kind, because eventually we'll see that we have to do this HG minus HF thing. But for right now, you want to remember not to use that value because it's right beside HG, and sometimes it's a close value to HG. Sometimes if I'm going quickly, I'll accidentally write in HFG instead of HG. Right? But here, because this is 181.94, right? Then we're in this case, right? Because this is saying that, you know, 181.9 is less than 1360, right? So we know we're a, su a, a subcooled liquid. So we're going to be somewhere 
over here, right? This is state six. If I had to pick my least favorite phase in this class, it's at least for now, we'll see by the end of the day that actually subcooled liquids are not hard to deal with. But for now, subcooled liquids are a little bit hard to deal with because um, often there's double interpolation. So when we look at the tables for superheated vapors, where's the superheated vapor table? Um, they tend to be pretty close together because I don't have the whole table here. It's tough to tell, right? But the ones for subcooled liquids, the pressures are really, really big, right? Um, so this one's a tough one to do, right? So here we're looking for values of H, right? And we know that we're at, what is the piece of information we have? We know that we're at 80 bar. Oh, this one's kind of tough because this is a double interpolation problem, right? Because we don't have a table for 80 bar. We have a table for 75 bar and a table for 100 bar, right? So we've got to set up this double interpolation here, right? So I'm just going to take this up to, maybe I'll get some fresh ice over here. Um, and I'll copy this guy down here. So now I got to try to figure out what's going on with my double interpolation, right? So we talked about when we're in this case, we're going to make our own table. But it's a little tricky when we don't have temperature or pressure. So we know that it's 181.94. So I want something that's at 80 bar. I have something at 75 bar and at 100 bar. Right Now, this is tricky. I want to try to find values where... 182 is in between both of these values, right? So here, this is going to be at 75 bar. My temperatures are going to be between 40 and 80, right? Here, this is going to be 174 point, I'm going to say 2, and 340.8, right? And over here, this is going to be 176.4, and this is going to be 342.8. I know my pressure is 80 bar. So in this case, I can find, I need two interpolation factors, right? A and I need B. It's not possible for me to find B right now, right? So I'm going to use A to go with pressure, right? So A is going to be in between here. And I'm going to use B to go here between these values. But it's not like if I had pressure and temperature. If I had pressure and temperature, I could find A and B right away. Right? But in this case, I can't because once I get here, I don't know what this value of B is going to be yet. Right? But I can figure out my value for A. Right? So I know A is going to be my actual pressure minus P min, I'm just going to say Pn, divided by Px minus Pn. This is going to be 80 minus 75 over 100 minus 75, which is 5 divided by 25 which is 0 0.2, right? So now if I'm trying to find the U values here, right? So U as a function, so this is also true for U, right? So this is gonna be U minus U at P min 
minus u at p max minus u at p min. So this means that u of a is going to be u n plus a times u max minus u min. And this is going to be true at both of these, for both of these temperature values, right? Or for both of these pressure ranges, I'm sorry, right? So I can do this both times, right? So I can, I can say that at the temperature is equal to 40 degrees, right? This is true if I interpolate with pressure that U at 80 bar is going to be equal to U at the lower pressure. That's going to be 174.2 plus 0 0.2 times 176.4 minus 174.2. If I put that into my calculator, right, I'm going to get 176.4 minus, or sorry, 176.4 minus 174.2 times 0 0.2 plus 174.2. And the number that I get here is 100 and 74.6 kilojoules per kilogram. That's my number here. So this is 174.6. Now at the temperature is equal to 80 degrees, then this is going to be Uh, U at 80 bar. This is equal to these other, right? So this is going to be it's the same sort of equation, but now we're working on a different row in the table. So this is 340.8 plus 0 0.2 times 342. 0.8 minus 340.8. This is going to be equal to 342.8 minus 340.8 times 0.2 plus 340.8. I get 341. Point two, right? That's in between these two numbers, right? Um, so that's good. That feels good, right? That we, you know, we're getting values that make sense, right? This one is in between these two numbers. This one is in between these two numbers. 341.2. And it's closer to the lower value than the higher value, right? Now, I know that H is equal to so now I can find my B value, right? So I can say that B is going to be equal to the value that I know, 181.94 minus this number here, 174.6 divided by 341.2 minus the lowest value, 174.6. If I do this, 181.9 minus 174.6. Again, because I'm not great at putting numbers into my calculator. I make mistakes all the time. I try to break this down into several parts, right? So that I, you know, and now I can look at this and say like, oh yeah, that's, that's, it doesn't look like the right number to me, right? So 181.94 minus 174.6, right? 
All right, this is 7.34. Right? So that's in real time. You get to see the, uh, you know, how, how easy it is to put numbers wrong into a calculator. 7.34, and this is going to be a much bigger number, 341.2 minus 174.6. This is 166.6, right? So then B is going to be equal to, I get um, 0.04, right? Which is kind of close to zero, right? It's not exactly zero, right? Because here I knew that this value was 181.9, right? Now here's the bad news. That's only half the problem because we're not trying to find H. We already knew H, right? But now that we know what our B value is, now we're free to try to find U, right? So now we would set up another one of these three by three matrices for U, right? So now we would say, 40 degrees and 80 degrees. And we know this is 75 bar and 80 bar and 100 bar. And now we're trying to find, so this was for H. This is going to be for U. Oops. So now we'd have to do almost all that work again. Right? But now we'd be using the values for U. Right? And you can see how that would be really cumbersome. Right? So here, this is going to be 166.6 and 333.1. Well, we can say 2 if we round up. Right? And 166.35, 166.35. Right, and 332.59. Now, one thing you could see here is that pressure doesn't really matter here, right? So this is 166.6 and 166.35. So this is almost doesn't matter, right? But we know that we can go for A here and for A this way, and then we can come at B this way. Right? So we would do this same thing here, right? We would say that U at a temperature of 40 degrees and a pressure of 80 bar is going to be equal to U min 166.6 plus A, which was 0.2 times the difference, right, 166.35, oops, minus 166.6. But here we can see this is almost going to be the same, 166.6, because there's almost no space in between these two numbers, right? But if I was doing this, this would be 166.35 minus 166.6 times 0.2, I'd get negative 0.05, right? Plus 166.6, and I'd get 166.55 kilojoules per kilogram. Right? So this is 166.55. Right? So that's there, right? And then I would find U of 80 degrees Celsius. This is temperatures and then pressures. And 80 bar. And this is going to be 332.2 plus 0 0.2 times 332.6 minus 332.2. Again, you're, there's very little difference between these two numbers. 332.6. So if this was an exam, um, I probably wouldn't even do this first interpolation with A. I would just say, ah, eh, maybe it's about halfway in between, right? 
um, minus 332.2 times 0.2. plus 332.2, I get 332.3, right, which is in between these two numbers, closer to the lower pressure, 332.3, right? Now I got to interpolate with B, and I know the B interpolation factor. That's why I had to go through the whole part with H, you know, even though it was a pain, Right now, I'm going to use my interpolation factor B, right? So this is going to be now U at a temperature, whatever this intermediate temperature is, and a pressure of 80 bar. This is now going to be 166.55 plus B which is 0 0.04 times the bigger number, 332.3 minus the smaller number, 166.55. And the number is going to be close to 166.55, right? Because it's, it's we're only 4% of the difference here. So 332.3 minus 166.55. 0.55, right? So the difference is 165.7, but we got to multiply that by 0.04, right? Plus 166.55, and it's 173.2 kilojoules per kilogram. So that's our answer, and it, you can see this is a huge pain, right? And especially because we weren't given temperatures and pressures, we were given a temperature and an enthalpy, so we couldn't directly calculate A and B off the bat, right? If you can do this problem, any double interpolation problem I'm going to give you, um, you'll be able to do. This is probably the hardest kind of double interpolation because you didn't get a temperature and a pressure. You got a temperature and a specific enthalpy, right? But it's pretty tricky, right? But the good news is we have a much better way. So this happens all the time in subcooled liquids because what happens is in superheated vapors, you have a lot of different pressure tables, right? The pressure tables are really close together. But for subcooled liquids, the tables are really spaced far, far apart, right? And that's because there's a much easier way to do this. And that's what we're going to talk about uh, in five minutes. So we'll come back at uh, 8.23 and we'll talk about a better way to do subcooled liquids. Um, okay, we'll start back up. So hopefully there's two things we saw from the last example. First, it's important to be able to identify the phase of the fluid when we're talking about water or something like it. And that learning how to draw the TV and PV diagrams, which you'll get some experience with in the homework, will help you hopefully identify the phase. The second thing we probably saw from this is that double interpolation is a pain. Um, double interpolation is most common in the subcooled liquid region. Right? But the good news is there's ways around doing it, right? So when we're going to deal with liquids and solids too, there's ways that we can avoid having to use double interpolation. So there's some really good assumptions that we can use to make our lives easier, right? Just a reminder, because I know right, we've been talking for a couple hours already, right? Um, we're trying to learn how to do this. We're trying to find the values of U because it's important for our first law calculations, right? We know that if the system is closed, and it always will be until we get done with the first exam, that delta E is equal to Q minus W. After we make some assumptions, this becomes delta U is equal to Q minus W. We find work as the integral of PDV. 
the change in the internal energy is actually equal to the change in mass, or the mass times the change in the specific internal energy, right? Because the textbook doesn't know how much mass we have, right? So in the textbook, we're always finding specific values. And then when you know how much mass is in your system, you just multiply that little w value by the mass to get the big w, or to the big u value, right? And then we're going to use w, the integral of PDV, and fixing the states to find all the specific internal energies, we're going to use that information to find the heat transfer, right? Because we haven't taken heat yet, right? Hopefully now, at least for water, we have some understanding of how to find these specific internal energies, right? Um, and we can see that if it's under the vapor dome, we're hoping that we get quality, because if we get quality, then I can just use the quality equation. But even if I'm given something else like the specific volume, then I can use the specific volume to find quality and then use the quality to find my information that I want, right? Which for the first law is specific internal energy. If I'm a subcooled liquid or a superheated vapor, right, then I'm going to use table A3 or A, sorry, A4 or A5. And those, remember, are tables of tables, where in the header, it's the pressure, right? Hopefully, they give me a pressure that's right on one of those tables, and I can just interpolate with temperature or something else if they give me specific internal energy or specific volume, right? But sometimes, especially when it's a subcooled liquid, it doesn't line up there, and we have to do this double interpolation which we just spent probably 15 minutes doing that last double interpolation problem. It's really time consuming. The math itself is not all that difficult, right? But the process is kind of a pain. And any very mechanical process like that, when you're doing math, like it's super easy to just put the wrong number somewhere and make a mistake, right? So we're gonna try to ask the question, do I need to do double interpolation, right? And sometimes the answer is yes, particularly if you have a superheated vapor and you have to do double interpolation, you just have to do it, right? But we'll see that if it's a liquid or if it's a solid, then we don't have to do double interpolation. There's a strategy that we have that'll give us really good answers reasonably quickly, right? And it comes down to this idea of specific heats. Now, this works for incompressible matter, right? So incompressible means that no matter what the pressure is, the specific volume or the density doesn't change, right? So if I take a block of copper and I push on it really hard, it's not gonna change the density or the specific volume of that copper. Right? Remember those density and specific volume is just the reciprocal of each other. Right? And it's also true for liquid water, right? Or any other liquid. Those molecules are bound together tight enough that the external force from the atmosphere doesn't really change how close those molecules are together, how densely they are packed, right? Unfortunately, anytime you start to put some vapor in the mix, then it becomes compressible. Right? And you, uh, you can't use this incompressible assumption anymore. Right? So this comes to incompressible liquids. Um, their properties tend to be strong functions of temperature, which means their properties change a lot with temperature, but they're weak functions of pressure, which means that their properties don't change very much with pressure. Right? We kind of saw that when we were doing the double interpolation last time, Remember, when we were interpolating with pressure, the numbers were almost the same between 75 bar and 100 bar, right? Remember, each bar is about an atmosphere. So that's a pretty big pressure change, but the properties didn't change. But when we changed the temperature from like 40 degrees to 80 degrees, we got pretty big changes, you know, from like 160 uh, kilojoules per kilogram up to like 100 or to 320 kilojoules per kilogram, right? Where we got like maybe 0.3 change as we moved from... Uh, what was it, 75 bar up to 100 bar, right? So the, the functions, H and U, were strong functions of temperature, but weak functions of pressure, right? 
So we're going to go to specific heats. So specific heat, um, you know, that's how much energy do I have to put in to change one unit of mass of a particular substance, one degree of whatever temperature that our temperature system that I'm talking about, right? So if we look at this, right? So this is the partial derivative of the specific internal energy by the partial derivative of temperature. When I'm talking about specific heat at constant volume, which is what we're going to talk about first, right? There's two different specific heats, one at constant volume, one at constant pressure. Now, I don't know if you've taken um, like a differential equations class, but there's a technique in calculus called separation of variables. So if you're going to try to integrate this, we can separate the partial u and the partial t, right? I can put everything that's a function of temperature on the left-hand side of my equation and everything that's a function of specific internal energy on the right-hand side of my equation, right? Then I can integrate both sides, right? Now, what we're going to assume here that for small temperature ranges, we're going to assume that specific heat is constant. Right? This is a reasonable assumption for solids and for liquids, right? And if that's true, right, then what we find is that the specific heat at constant volume, or Cv, times the change in temperature is approximately equal to the change in the specific internal energy. So if I wanted to find the change in little u, it would be Cv times delta T. Or if I wanted to find the change in big U, it would be the mass times Cv times delta T. I can do the same trick with this specific heat at constant pressure, but now on the top here, I have the partial derivative with respect to H. H is that other property on the table. It's specific enthalpy. We don't know too much about it yet, but I can still do um, separation of variables. And if I assume that Cp is constant, I'll get that delta H is Cp times delta T, or that delta big H is mass times Cp times delta T. Right? In order to write these equations down, you have to tell me what your assumptions are. So your assumptions are that this is an incompressible substance. So for subcooled liquids and for solids, you can say that the specific heats are approximately constant. And the cool thing is that for liquids and solids, the specific heat at constant volume and the specific heat at constant pressure are the same number. So liquid water, there is no difference between Cp and Cv. Right? There's only one specific heat. Right? So that last problem, or at least a problem like it, where maybe we know the temperature down here and we know the specific internal energy, right? Well, that's kind of a pain, right? Because we had to do all that double interpolation, right? Because it's in some liquid state and I don't even know what table to look at, right? So what I could do is I found out here this was at 80 bar when we did this double interpolation, right? So I could find this point here. This is the saturated liquid specific internal energy right and that saturated liquid specific internal energy the saturation temperature the temperature at which water boils when we're at 80 bar that's about 80 times one atmospheric pressure right that's equal to this value of specific internal energy right 1305.6 but because i know the temperature here and I know the temperature here, right? I could find the change in the specific internal energy and then calculate U6 if I didn't know what U6 was from that double interpolation, right? So I could look up in the textbook that CV is 4.38 kilojoules per kilogram Kelvin, right? And then I could say, well, I could get an approximation for U6 by taking UF, minus Cv times the change in temperature. And I would get that U6 is about 200 kilojoules per kilogram. 
right? Now, that's not too bad, right? I'm off by 25 kilojoules per kilogram, which may or may not be important depending on the application that you're working on, right? That's part of the reason why as an engineer, you'll get paid is because part of your job will be determining what assumptions are appropriate, right? And in order to do that, you'll need to know how much uncertainty, how much error you're willing to accept in your calculations. Now, that error, you might be able to accept more error if you're doing something like heating your house in the wintertime. Maybe you're okay if you, you know, overshoot that set point by a couple of degrees and then come back down and oscillate back and forth for a little bit, right? But if you're doing something like, what is it, Blue Origin, that like, you know, made a satellite that's going to come by and land on some, you know, asteroid as it's hurtling by through space or whatever... Um, you know, I'd imagine that your margin of error in something like that is pretty small, right? So you might want to have, you know, tighter tolerances, right? So that's part of what being an engineer is, is you're the person that makes the call about how much error is, you know, enough, right? So that's not an easy thing to do, right? In this case, we're off by about 15%, which in some applications is probably fine, and in other applications is uh, going to be too high, right? But the good news is that while this, so the other thing that happens here is as your temperature difference gets bigger, your error gets bigger too, right? But the good news is we've got an even better way to um, to get values for specific internal energy when we're um, talking about liquids, right? And the thing about doing this is we had to find the saturated liquid value here because I can only use this approximation if I'm going from a liquid to a liquid, right? Anytime there's vapor in the mix, we can't assume that it's incompressible anymore, right? So we can't say CV is constant, right? So here, what we can do is for any given pressure... You know, because what we said was for these incompressible substances, the pressure doesn't really matter. The properties are a strong function of temperature, but a weak function of pressure. So we can say, well, we don't really care about the pressure as long as we know the temperature. If that's true, then for any subcooled liquid, as long as I know the temperature, I can get a pretty good approximation of the specific internal energy. Right? So I'm going to prove this to you, or at least demonstrate to you that in a lot of cases this works right so if we're at one atmosphere right we know that water would start to boil if it was at 100 degrees but it hasn't boiled yet if it's a liquid right so this is uf at one atmosphere right where the temperature is exactly 100 degrees there is no error associated with this number right because that's the actual number but what if I increase this to 25 bar, right? So I just multiplied the pressure by about 25, right? Remember, um, just to get a sense of this, right? If you're swimming in the water to go from one atmosphere to two atmospheres, you have to swim down 10 meters, right? If you've ever swum down 10 meters, you can really feel that in your eardrums, right? We're talking about... Um, going up to 25 bar, right? That's a huge, huge pressure, right? Well, comparatively, right? For humans, that's a really big pressure. Here, our number changes, but not that much, right? This number's on the tables, right? Um, but if I use this approximation, I've only got 0.2% error, right? If I go up to 50 bar, 50 times that pressure then I'm still below 3%, right? 75 bar, 100 bar, 150 bar, we start to break 1% error here, right? 200 bar, 250, right? Even at 300 bar, 300 times the pressure, right? This number, 418.94, in this number, 410.78, the actual specific internal energy, they're only different by about 2%. 
What this means is really anytime you're talking about a subcooled liquid, you can approximate the specific internal energy or as it turns out, any other property as the saturated liquid value for that same temperature, as long as you're a liquid. Right? That means you don't care about um, double interpolation for subcooled liquids. Right? So even though we just spent whatever it was, 15 minutes going through that last, um, that last example, you'll rarely have to do that. Right? Which is good because it's kind of cumbersome and a pain. Right? But it's good to know that it's a strategy that's available to you. And if you really, really, really care about your accuracy, if you decide that 2% error is too much for whatever application that you have, then you would have to do some kind of double interpolation in that case. But if not, if you can accept that kind of error, which in this class you can, um, then you're free to use this assumption. This is a very nice assumption and it will save you a ton of effort. Right? Um, right? So here, what we're doing graphically is we're saying, yes, this point is actually over here. Right? This slope is actually far more vertical than I'm showing it on this graph. Right? We're going to assume it's the same as this point over here. Right? The same temperature, but on that saturated liquid line. Right? In this case, right, it turns out that the error is almost nothing. Right? Um, it gets to be a little bit higher if we start to talk about H, right? which we'll talk about specific enthalpy. And there's a reason for that um, because it's a little bit more, it's got a pressure term in there, the difference between U, H is U plus PV, but we don't care about that yet. Um, so the error is a little bit bigger, but it's still not that big. Right? So this is a pretty good assumption, right? So the good news is this assumption for subcooled liquids works really well, and it saves you a lot of time. So I would suggest that you use this all the time when you're using liquids, right? Um, the bad part is anytime you make an assumption, Right? This is the reason that we have to track our assumptions is that we're, anytime we make an assumption, we move further away from the real world and closer to like a cartoon version of the world. So you always want to write down the assumptions that you make. Now, this tends to be a good assumption, which is why we're teaching you about it. Right? So this says, you know, the other good thing about it is that this is a really good assumption. Right? So anytime you have a liquid, I want you to use this assumption you can do double interpolation if you want, right? but it turns out it takes a lot of effort. Right? Um, we're going to go through another example here. Um, I'll go through it pen and paper, and we'll try this one. Right? At least until setting up the problem, we'll do it this way. Right? So... What happens in this problem is it says that we have this system shown here where our system consists of some copper, right, and some water, right? There's some electrical resistance over here. The mass doesn't matter with this resistor, right? The temperature is initially 27 degrees for the copper and 50 degrees for the water. We add 100 kilojoules into the system, and eventually the temperature is at equilibrium. Equilibrium means nothing changes with respect to time. So what's going to happen here is that the temperature of the copper is going to move up, right? Because we're adding energy. I don't know if the temperature of the water is going to move down, and they're going to come together over there or if the temperature of the copper is going to move up here and the water is going to come over here. But eventually, with enough time, these two temperatures are going to be the same. Right? And we can use the first law to figure out what that steady state temperature is. Right? So we're going to start with the first law of thermodynamics. Right? So here we've assumed... 
that it's a closed system. Right? That gives us this equation. Delta E is equal to Q minus W. I'm further going to assume that I can neglect changes in kinetic energy, right? changes in potential energy, and changes in spring energy. What that means is that my governing equation is going to become U2 minus U1 is, oh, this is a big U, is equal to Q minus W. Now, in this system, there are two different kinds of mass. So what this means is that, well, I can break this down first into mass times little u2 minus little u1 is equal to q minus w. Right? But what this, I, there's two different kinds of mass, right? So this is the mass of copper times u2 minus u1 of copper plus the mass of water times U2 minus U1 of water, that's going to be equal to Q minus W. That part makes sense? That's the symbolic solution. Right? This is really good. Right? So what we can do with this is we've demonstrated some understanding of generally how to solve closed system processes. But now we have to start making assumptions that are specific to this problem, right? And the first thing is Q and W. So here we know, right, in our system that this resistor is putting some energy into the system. I don't know if I should call this Q or if I should call it W but it is putting energy into the system, right? If it's heat, this is heat into the system. Does anybody remember what the sign is for heat that we add to the system? Jules? Positive, positive right? So if this is, then this would be some positive number. If it's work and we add it to the system, does anybody remember the sign of that one? Hip. Right? And win. Right? So work in would be negative. Right? And I can't remember the value here was 100 kilojoules. Right? So this would be positive 100 kilojoules or negative 100 kilojoules. So it doesn't matter whether I call it heat or work. Let's see. If I call it heat, then heat, this would be 100 kilojoules. And the left-hand side, no, that's the right-hand side of the equation. It's late, right? Is equal to 100 kilojoules, right? If I call it work, then it's going to be negative 100 kilojoules. And the right-hand side is going to be negative, negative 100 kilojoules, right? Which is the same thing as 100 kilojoules. So it actually doesn't matter whether I call it heat or work. In this case, I think of this um, as joule heating, right? As this, you know, current times resistance. So I'm going to say that work is equal to zero in this case, and that Q is equal to 100 kilojoules. But if you called it work, you'd get the same answer. Right? Now, in this case, I've got to make some assumptions, right? So here, I need to find out what delta U is, right? Because I was told the mass of copper and I was told the mass of water. And this is what always happens in thermodynamics class, right? I get to a point where my symbolic solution looks good if I could only fix all the states in the problem, right? The problem is I don't know T2, right? I don't know T2 for copper. I don't know T2 for water. 
But because it's at equilibrium, I know that T2 for copper is equal to T2 for water. So I'm just going to call it T2. Right? That's what equilibrium means, is that nothing exciting is happening. Everything just, we, sometimes we call it steady state. No variables are changing with time. And if we were in a situation where the water and the copper were at different temperatures, they would transfer heat between each other and the temperatures of those two substances would be changing with time, right? So what do I do with this, right? I got to ask myself, what's in my system, right? Remember, that's one of my three different questions is what's inside my system, right? This is a solid, the copper. The water, it starts, I'm going to assume this is one atmosphere. It at least starts as a liquid. I'm going to assume here that the water doesn't boil. Right? That's something I got to check, right? But if this is always a liquid, right, then both of these things are incompressible. Which means for incompressible liquids and solids, delta U is equal to CV times delta T. In this case, it actually doesn't matter if I pick CP or CV. Because for solids and liquids, CP and CV are the same. We'll see in the last part of the class that for gases, it does matter, right? So I'll keep this. I remember that the V goes with the U because they look kind of the same. Or at least V looks more like U than it looks like H, right? So here, I, I can change my equation over here. And it becomes the mass of copper times, oops, times CV of copper times, right, because delta U became C. The other thing on the left-hand side, that delta E or delta U, it's always at the end minus at the beginning, right? So this was 2 minus 1. So this becomes T2 minus T1 of copper. plus the mass of water times CV of water times T2, it's the same value, minus T1 of water. And this is going to be equal to Q, right? I know that this is 100 kilojoules. I was given the mass of water. I think I was given the specific heats. If not, I can look them up. I think in the table, in the textbook, it's um, so that we weren't given CP and CV or CV values. I can find these, I think. You might have to hunt around in the tables. Um, the cover sheet for the tables is like a table of contents. But I think that this might be it might be table A1, but it might also be something like table A20. But I think it's on table A1. I can find values for CVs. Um, but there'll be somewhere in there that talks about specific heats. Right? I was given these initial temperatures. So really, the only thing that I don't know in this equation is T2. Right? Now, in this... I'll show you what the answer is. So there's some algebra that goes along with doing this, right? You can see in this case, I canceled out Q dot, or I canceled out Q and kept W, but it doesn't matter, right? Like we saw that the right-hand side is 100 joules no matter what. Um, I got these values from the textbook, right? And then I put these in. The only thing that I don't know is T2, but I know these two temperature values are the same. And I see that the temperature value is almost 50 degrees, right? So I ask myself, does that make sense, right? So what we saw, right? So first we got an answer. So the first thing that I want to check is units, right? So here it's going to be in Celsius. So that's good, right? Because it, um, 
it means that the units are right. So I can't prove that I'm wrong. I do sometimes have to be careful because CP and CV will be given in kilojoules per kilogram Kelvin, but we multiply them by a delta T, right? Now, if you think about a thermometer, and if that thermometer has Celsius values on the left side, but Kelvin values on the right-hand side, the spacing between those lines are the same. The delta is the same. So anytime you have a temperature difference, it doesn't matter if you use Celsius or Kelvin. Or if you're in the imperial system, um, it's Fahrenheit, but the absolute temperature in the imperial system, we call it Rankin. Right? Some people say Rankine, but I always say Rankin. Um, and that's kind of the same thing where zero is absolute zero. Right? Um, so here, 49.7. So that means that the, um, where was my, so the copper temperature, I think I maybe mixed these up. Right? The copper temperature looks like didn't move very much, but the water temperature moved a lot. Is that correct? I think I wrote it down wrong on the slides, right? So that 49, right, means the water temperature didn't change a lot, but the copper temperature did change a lot. That to me makes more sense, right? Because water is a really good heat sink. It takes a lot of energy to change the temperature of water. We can see that in this slide here because the specific heat for water is 4.18 kilojoule, right, per kilogram Kelvin. The specific heat for copper is more than 10 times less, right? You know this, water, can, or water, water takes a long time to boil, right? It takes a long time to change the temperature. Copper conducts heat really well, right? It doesn't take much energy to increase the temperature of copper. So here we see a large change in the copper temperature from 27 almost up to 50 and almost no change in the water temperature. That to me makes sense. Now, like I said at the beginning, because I'm not sure, what I didn't know where this steady state was going to come out. If it's in between these two values or if it's above those, all those things are both possible. It's not possible for it to come down here because we're adding heat. But this is within the realm of possibility, right? So my confidence here is pretty high because I got the right units and I see that the copper temperature changed more than the water temperature changed. changed. And that to me makes sense when we're talking about the specific heat, right? Um, so that kind of brings us to the end of this idea of specific heats. Um, but this was a case where it made sense to use delta U is equal to CP times delta T. I guess the other thing we have to check, right? Here we assumed that the, that the liquid water didn't boil, right? So I'm assuming it's at one atmosphere and the temperature basically stayed the same. So even, even if, the, if it was liquid to begin with, it's probably liquid at the end because the temperature went down, right? So as long as the pressure didn't change, we're okay. Right. So we'll break for maybe three or four minutes. Maybe we'll come back at, well, let's come back at 9.05 and we'll do the last part of the lecture. But again, I'll be hanging around here if you have any questions. Thanks. Um, thanks for coming back. Um, we've been talking about how to find delta U, right? But we've really only been focused on water which all the strategies we're using for water will also work for other things that we're going to boil and condense, like refrigerants. But it doesn't really work for ideal gases, right? So what makes an ideal gas an ideal gas is that neighboring gas molecules don't really know their neighbors, right? They're far enough apart that as they're moving, they have that Brownian motion, right? that random walk that they're doing, they're not banging into each other, right? So what we're gonna do is talk about how we find changes in specific internal energy for ideal gases, right? So how do we deal with compressible materials? Right? 
So again, you're going to get tired of this particular graph or this picture, but this is the strategy. How do you solve problems for the first midterm is you make the assumption that it's a closed system, right? That gives you this equation. You find the work as the integral of PDV. You get some assumptions here. You neglect kinetic and potential energy as long as you can, right? And then you get change in internal energy, which is mass times change in specific internal energy, right? And then you use the first law to find Q, right? Now, part of the difficulty of this class is there are many different strategies to find delta U, right? And it depends on that other question that we ask. One of the big questions that we ask is, what's in my system, right? So if it's, it's always a two-part question. What's the fluid, right? So if it's water, you got to know what the phase is. But sometimes it's an ideal gas, right? So if it's water, you got to say, is it two phase, right? Or is it a liquid or is it a vapor, right? If it's a solid or liquid, right? You can say things like uh, delta U is CV times delta T, right? Or delta H is CP times delta T. And actually delta U and delta H are the same for liquids, essentially, and for solids, right? But that was when we were on the liquid side, right? What about on the vapor side? When we're um, above the vapor dome, but to the right of the critical point, after something has boiled, do we always need a table to find values here, right? And the answer is, well, maybe not always, right? As long as we're really far away from the vapor dome, right? So here's kind of an experiment um, that's been done, right? So you can see that there's this piston cylinder assembly. It's filled with some kind of a gas, right? We're going to move the piston up and down, and we're going to track the pressure and the specific volume, right? Um, we have one particular gas in here, and we know what its molecular weight is, right? Or its atomic number, right? And we'll do this for lots of different temperatures. We're just going to cycle this piston up and down. That's going to change the pressure, right? So what else happens? And the neat thing here is that if we can keep the temperatures constant, we see that for any given gas, right, we get these different curves, right? And I like this, I like this uh, animation, so I do it multiple times, right? But now, what people found out, what is if, if we extrapolated all of these curves back to a pressure of zero, they all intersect my vertical axis, which is pressure times specific volume over temperature at the same value, right? Now, this is a different specific, usually when we're engineers, because um, we're talking about a lot of stuff. So we talk about specific volume as volume divided by mass. My brother's a biochemist, and in chemistry, they're often thinking about smaller amounts of stuff. So instead of talking about kilograms or pounds, they talk about moles, right? Now, maybe you've been trying not to remember these things, right? But one mole is a certain number of molecules, right? Avogadro's number of molecules, right? So if you're talking about the amount of stuff you have in terms of moles, all of these things cross at the same point, and that's what we call the universal gas constant, which we denote as R with a bar on top, right? That's why this specific volume has a bar on top, because it's the volume divided by the number of moles, right? And not by the mass, right? So what's cool here is that for the same gas at different temperatures, if you can maintain the temperature constant, all of these things cross that axis at the same point, and that point is the universal gas constant, right? And what's even cooler is if you set it up like this and you talk about how much stuff you have in terms of the number of moles, it doesn't even matter what the gas is. For all of these different gases, it crosses that vertical axis at the same point. That's what makes the universal gas constant universal, is that it doesn't matter what the gas is, right? So that's our universal gas constant, 
right? Now, if you're like me in high school and they talked mostly about metric, this is 8.31 kilojoules per kilomole Kelvin, right? But there are imperial values for these numbers too. Um, you don't have to memorize these constants. Some of them are on the equation sheet that we've prepared, which is available on the My Courses website. But also values like this in the um, reference material, so the reference book that if you were writing in person, we'd give you like a spiral bound notebook with all these tables in it. But on the My Courses website, there's a PDF that has all that same information in it. And on the front cover of that, right, which is also the inside cover of your textbook, they have a whole bunch of constants, including this, uh, this universal gas constant. Yeah, it does feel like this one's going by pretty fast. So we don't, I'm going to give you the background about what the uh, compressibility and the universal gas constant and stuff is. But you're never really going to have to derive these things. But I want to give you a picture about where this information comes from. Right? So this is the universal gas constant, which means that it's the same for every gas. Because we're talking about the number of molecules as how much stuff we have instead of the mass of the, of the gas, right? So why do we care, right? This isn't a chemistry class, right? This is a thermodynamics class, right? Um, so if you remember that graph that we put up here, right? On one axis is PV over T, right? And on the other axis is pressure, right? And the intersection is always R bar. So if on my vertical axis, instead of PV over T, it was PV over T times R bar, everything would still cross at the same point, but now it would all cross at the number one, right? So that's what we call this compressibility factor. Right? And again, we're only talking about this to give you some context of what's going on, right? So this is pressure times the specific volume with respect to moles divided by the universal gas constant over the temperature. And this is great for chemists, right? And biochemists like my brother, right? But in engineering, we're usually talking about more stuff. So we don't usually talk about moles. We talk about mass, right? Or we talk about, um, you know, how much mass there is, right? So whether it's kilograms or it's pounds mass, right? Um, so typically... We'll talk about specific volume with respect to mass. And that's nice because it's maybe a little bit more practical. But there's a downside too. And that downside is that we no longer get a universal gas constant. Instead, we get a specific gas constant, a value of R, that's going to be different for every gas. Right? So that's the difference between R and R bar. Right? Um, but it's still the same idea. Right? It's just that for different gases, they're going to cross that vertical axis at different points. Right? So we can plot this on a compressibility chart. Right? And this is kind of a cool thing scientifically. Right? So this is the kind of thing that people right? Papers about and, and it, you know, they get a lot of attention because they're getting the behavior of the materials, right? We call this collapse, right? In a good way, because what you see here is it doesn't matter what the gas is. It all follows the same behavior, right? Um, so on the vertical axis, we have this PV over RT, right? This compressibility factor that goes between zero and one, right? Now, what's a little tricky here, though, is that instead of talking about temperature and pressure, now we talk about what we call reduced temperature and reduced pressure. This means we take the temperature and pressure and we divide by, remember we talked about, so all of these things, like, like if you think about a gas like nitrogen, nitrogen can be a liquid, right? 
It can be liquid nitrogen. If you compress it down enough and the temperature gets dropped low enough, it has a vapor dome, just like water. It's just that here on Earth, we're so far away from that vapor dome, we don't think about it too much. Right? But on the top of that vapor dome, the apex, right, we have that critical point. So there's a critical temperature and a critical pressure. So if for all of these gases, we take the temperature and divide it by the critical temperature, we get this reduced temperature. And we take the pressure divided by the critical pressure and we get the reduced pressure, right? Then we can plot it on here and it doesn't matter what gas we get all of these lines end up being the same. Right? And in science, that's really cool, right? If you read, uh, I don't know if anybody's read A Brief History of Time by Stephen Hawking. I read it, I think, when I was uh, maybe a freshman in university, and there wasn't a lot of it that I understood, right? Probably still wouldn't understand a lot of it. But part of it was this idea of chasing um, this grand unified theory of physics, right? And you know you get closer to that when you get results like this. So you can explain how all gases act, right? And that's pretty cool. You're moving towards a better understanding of the universe, right? So this is kind of neat, right? Now, um, right, so this is, we call this similarity, um, but you don't really need to know that. When you, talk, when you take fluids class, they'll talk a little bit more about what that is, right? If we zoom in, near this uh, vertical axis, right, all of these graphs come to one at a reduced pressure of zero, right? Now, what that means is that if our compressibility factor here is equal to one, right, then we can get this equation. The pressure times the specific volume is equal to the universal gas constant times the temperature, right? And we can also say the pressure times the specific volume is equal to the specific gas constant times the temperature. So in high school, when you were doing chemistry, maybe you used this equation, although maybe you called it pressure times volume is equal to the number of moles times the universal gas constant times T, right? But here, because we're talking about not the number of moles, but the mass, right? Then we get this version of the equation. And our price for doing that is we have to use the specific gas constants and not the universal gas constant, right? But if we ever want to find the specific gas constant, we can take the universal gas constant and divide by the molar mass. Molar masses of different materials can be found on table A1 or A1E if you're talking about imperial units. Right? This is the ideal gas law. Right? But you can only use the ideal gas law if Z, our compressibility factor, is about 1. Right? Otherwise, it doesn't really reflect what's going on physically. Right? Now, the neat thing about this is usually to fix a state we need to know two independent intensive properties, right? But if we're talking about an ideal gas, now we have this set relationship between P, V, and T, which means that we can fix the state sometimes with just one property, as long as it's a property on a certain list of properties, right? Which is pretty cool. If I know the temperature of an ideal gas, I can fix the state. Right? with only one piece of information, because I've made the assumption that it's an ideal gas. Right? So when can we use the ideal gas law? Right? And the answer is when this compressibility factor is equal to 1. Right? So when does the compressibility factor equal 1? So the first case is when the pressure is much lower than the critical pressure. Right? In the second case, right, because you see when the pressure gets close to zero, all of these curves, doesn't matter what the temperature is, they all converge to one, right? When the pressure is low, that means the molecules are really far apart. So the air molecules or the gas molecules don't know they have a neighbor, right? They can, they can be doing this Brownian motion without bumping into each other, right? 
Another time we can do this is when the temperature is much larger than the critical temperature. Right? This is the same thing. As the temperature goes up, these molecules spread out more, which means that they get further and further apart. So they don't really interact with their neighbors as much. Right? So this is often the case for gases, is like, like for liquid nitrogen, in most sort of terrestrial environments, you're so far away from the critical temperature of nitrogen that it's reasonable to assume that it's an ideal gas. It's not true for steam, right? Which is unfortunate because we use steam a lot in this class, but steam is not an ideal gas because the water molecules in steam are still too close together. They still interact with each other too much. So that's why we need those superheated vapor tables for steam. But for things that we normally think of as gases like nitrogen or oxygen or air, which is kind of a combination of different molecules, right? Mostly nitrogen. Um, we can assume that they're ideal gases. Right? So when we have ideal gases, how do we find U? Right? How do we find that specific internal energy so we can put it into the first law and get answers for problems? Right? So if we're talking about air, this is the gas that we're most concerned with in this class, right? because it's the thing that goes into an internal combustion engine. It's also the thing that goes into a natural gas power plant, which is something else that we'll talk about in this class eventually, right? So it's, a, it's obviously a very important working fluid, right? So air, we can typically assume is an ideal gas. Because it's an ideal gas, that means we can use the ideal gas law, right? Typically, we'll use the ideal gas law in different forms. So we can say the pressure times the specific volume is equal to the specific gas constant times the temperature. Remembering that that specific gas constant is the universal gas constant divided by the molar mass. Or we can say that the pressure times the volume is equal to the mass times the specific gas constant times the temperature. If we need to find the mass, although often it will just be given, or we'll calculate it from this equation. But if we knew the number of moles, then we could take the number of moles times the molar mass and get the mass. Right? But then if it's a closed system where there's no chemical reactions, that means that the mass is constant because it's a closed system. And if the structure of the gas molecules is not changing. If there's no chemical reactions that are happening, then the gas always stays the same. So the specific gas constant stays the same. And if M and R, M times R is constant, right? Then that means PV over T is also constant, right? So P1V1 over T1 is equal to P2V2 over T2. We'll eventually get some examples where we do this kind of thing. But the thing that I want you to know about ideal gases is that unlike when we were talking about liquids, when we said something like CV times delta T, these are equations where the temperature stands alone. It's not a temperature difference. Any equation where you have a temperature that's not a temperature difference, that means you have to use absolute temperatures meaning you have to use Calvin or Rankine, right? You'll get a very different answer if you use zero degrees Celsius and 273 degrees Kelvin, right? So if you look at your equation and it has temperature but not delta T, you have to use Calvin or Rankine. And this helps us, but it doesn't help us find the specific internal energy, right? So how do we find specific internal energy? Right? Just like for water, it was a two-part question, right? What's the fluid? What's the thing inside of our system? Oh, it's water? Oh, because it's water, I need to know if it's a liquid or it's a gas or it's some combination of liquid and gas. It was like a two-part question, right? For ideal gases, 
if the answer to what's in my system is air and that's an ideal gas, I'm still not done. I got to ask myself something else. We're going to make some kind of an assumption. We're either going to say that the specific heat is variable. This will give us a more accurate answer. Or we're going to say that the specific heat is constant, which will give us an answer more quickly. Right? So there's a trade-off here between accuracy and computational expense, right? Or time to complete the problem. Right? If it's variable specific heat, in remember my um my first law equation is going to be mass times the change in specific internal energy. Right? Delta U is going to stay as delta U. Right? And each specific internal energy is going to be a function of temperature that I'm going to have to find by looking it up on a table. Right? And I'll get that information, at least if it's metric, from table A22. If it's imperial, it will be from A22E, provided that the material is gas. Right? So that will look something like this. So I'll say, okay, ideal gas properties of air... Remember the cool thing about air in any ideal gas, because we have this PVT relationship, sometimes all I need to fix the state is one piece of information, one intensive property, as long as it's one of these intensive properties, which for now, the only ones we're going to care about are temperature and specific internal energy. So basically, if I know the temperature of the air, I can find the specific internal energy. Right? So if it's 300 degrees, then the specific internal energy is 214.07. If it's 307 degrees, then I can interpolate between 305 and 310. Right? Just like I would interpolate on those liquid tables. That'll give me a more accurate answer if I use those tables. But if I want a faster answer, particularly as my temperature differences are small... I could approximate the change in the specific internal energy as the specific heat at constant volume times delta T. If I use this approximation, I'm never going to find U1 and U2. But I don't care, right? Because my equation will go from mass times delta U to mass times CV times delta T. So I get an approximation for what delta U is. Right, so first, let's look at constant specific heat. Right? So just like for liquids and solids, specific heat is defined either as the partial of U by the partial of T or the partial of H as the partial of T. Right? So here, if we're talking about at constant volume, and again, I remember that CV goes with delta U right? because V looks more like a U than it does an H, right? and CP goes with delta H. And we can do that same separation of variables trick that we did for liquids and solids, right? And we can get, here I can separate my variables. I integrate both sides. And if I make the assumption that CV is constant and not a function of temperature, then I'll get delta U is equal to CV times delta T. In truth, CV is not constant. It's some nonlinear function of temperature. Right? So what happens is this is an assumption. It makes my life easier, but it makes me step further into the cartoon. Right? It, it makes my answer less realistic. And then my answer, my uncertainty gets bigger as my temperature difference gets bigger. Right? Because as my temperature difference gets bigger, CV changes more. Right? But depending on your application, maybe this is a good assumption. Right? If I was trying to find the change in specific enthalpy, which we'll do a lot more for exam two than exam one, I can use the same process, but delta H becomes CP times delta T. Right? I remember that CV goes with delta U, because I think a V looks like U. And then I had one student, she told me, that she remembered that CP goes with H because H is called enthalpy, right? And there's a P right there. 
And so it doesn't matter how you remember it, but unlike for solids and liquids, when CP and CV were the same value, for gases, CP and CV are different values, right? So you have to remember to keep them, you know, use the CV for delta U and the CP for delta H, right? Um, here, you don't really need to know this, at least not yet, right? But the definition of specific enthalpy is uh, that it's the specific internal energy plus the pressure times the specific volume. I think the textbook, the reason I tell you this, one of the solutions for one of the homework problems uses this relationship, that for ideal gases, PV is equal to RT. So you could find H if it's an, excuse me, you could find H as an ideal gas as being the specific internal energy plus the gas constant times the temperature. But I never do it this way. But as you're looking through the solutions, I've had people ask about this, so I wanted to include it here. It's in the notes too, so you can see where that comes from. So that's how we could use constant specific heat, right? But how do we use variable specific heat? We'll see how we do that in this example that we'll walk through in the last 10 minutes or so in the class, right? So how do we find delta U for ideal gases? Right. We have two different models, two different ways of trying to do this, right? One with constant specific heat and the other with variable specific heat. But here, our states are the same. We have state one and state two. State one has 293 degrees Kelvin and one bar. And state two is 564 degrees Kelvin and 10 bar. One of the things that should happen to you as you do more and more problems with ideal gases is your spidey sense has to start tingling anytime you have an ideal gas problem. Sometimes they're going to be sneaky and they're going to give you the temperature value in Celsius or in Fahrenheit. You will have to convert that to Calvin or to Rankine. Because for ideal gases, first of all, if you're using the table, it gives you temperatures in absolutes. But second of all, if you're going to use the ideal gas law, the temperatures are not delta Ts. They're just Ts, right? So you need to use absolute temperatures. So anytime you're working with an ideal gas, I want the hairs on the back of your neck to start standing up, right? Your spidey sense to start tingling, and you gotta say, oh, I have to turn the temperatures into Kelvin. So let's go ahead and find delta U in these two cases, once using constant specific heat and once using variable specific heat. So our first option here, or one option, is I could say, oh, I'm going to use constant specific heat for this problem. What that means is that I'm never going to find the individual values of specific heat. Instead, I'm going to approximate delta U, which I need for the first law, as the specific heat at constant volume times the change in temperature. In this case, I could use Calvin or Rankine because this is delta T. It's not the first law, or it's not the, it's not the uh, ideal gas law where, um, where the temperature stands alone, right? But here I have my temperatures in Calvin. If you're in absolute temperatures, you'll never get the answer wrong. Because if it's a delta T, it's the same answer, right? So here, they were nice enough to tell us that the specific heat is approximately 0.73 kilojoules per kilogram Kelvin. And I know T2 and T1. So I can find delta U as the specific heat times T2 minus T1. I always, once I put numbers into my equations, I also put units. I notice that the Calvin cancels here, which is nice because I get a delta U value that's about 200, but the units are kilojoules per kilogram, which is what I expect for specific internal energy because it should be energy, which is kilojoules, divided by mass, which is kilograms. So in this case, 
I get delta U as approximately 200 degrees or 200 kilojoules per kilogram. And you can see the attractiveness of this method is that it's really fast, right? Especially if you're given CV. But what do we do if we're using table A22, if we're using variable specific heat? This is an acknowledgement that CV is actually not constant. So we're going to look up values, right? This will be a more accurate answer. If, you know, if I'm doing something like, you know, landing a satellite on an asteroid, I probably don't want to have too much uncertainty in my answer. So I'm going to use this, which is a more accurate process, right? So now I'm going to actually find U1 and U2. So here, my temperature at state one is 293. That's in between 290 and 295. That means I have to interpolate, right? So we've had some experience with interpolation now, right? But here I can see my interpolation factor A would be 193 minus 190, that's three, divided by the whole temperature range, which is five, right? So it's gonna be 0.6, right? It's gonna be a little bit past half, right? And here I could see half would be 208 point something, right? And I get just over 209. So to me, that number makes sense, right? It's the right units and it's in the ballpark of what I would expect. The next number, is 564, which is just about halfway between 560 and 570. I gotta remember to look at the values for specific internal energy, right? It's about halfway, but if I did the math, right? I get 407.44, right? Here, right, if I tried to find the delta, right? Because the first law, only ever asks for the delta. That's why using the constant specific heat model is okay, even though I never find U2 or U1, but I know the difference between them, or at least I have an approximation for the difference. And I get a number that's very close, right? So here, if I talked about the error in this case, it's very small, right? And this, you know, if you talk about a human, this temperature difference is really big. For a human, you would really feel the difference between 293 Kelvin, right? That's like 20, it's like room temperature, right? And 564 Kelvin. That's really hot if you're a human, right? But it's not necessarily hot if you're, you know, the outlet of an, you know, if you're in an afterburner of a military air aircraft, right? Temperature might get much hotter than that, right? So here, we know that the bigger our temperature difference is, the bigger this error will get. But even here, for a relatively large temperature difference, for a human anyway, the constant specific heat model is still pretty good. Right? So this is how we find delta U or U for ideal gases. I know we covered a lot today, right? But hopefully, what I hope we got out of this, right, the big picture stuff here is how do we find U and or delta U, right? So we did several examples for when the working fluid is water, right? So you, hopefully you have... Um, more confidence doing that. I think as you start to get into the homework, right, you'll sort of solidify some of these ideas. And we have started to introduce how do we find delta U for ideal gases. So if we look through, you know, what's essentially two weeks of work that we covered in two days, right, we know that when we have a closed system, the first law is delta E, is equal to Q minus W. We find work as the integral of PDV, which means I need to know how pressure changes with volume. And then 
I need to know what's the fluid. Because when I know what's the fluid, after I've assumed that kinetic and potential energy and spring energy um, can be neglected, if that's the case, then I'm just left with this change in specific internal energy times the mass. So then what I need to do is say, what's the fluid? If it's water, I have to know what the phase is. And if it's an ideal gas, I have to pick between these two models, right? Whether it's constant specific heat or variable specific heat. And then hopefully, as I do that, right, that's the sort of choose your own adventure part of the problem. I'll be able to get some approximation for delta U, and then I'll get some kind of answer for work as the integral of PDV. And then from that, I'll be able to get the heat transform. So that's kind of where we are right now. What we'll start to do next class is start to look more at first law examples, right? Where we're putting all of these pieces together. So between now and next class, you'll have two different homework assignments that are due. One is due tomorrow and one is due Monday. And then you'll also start to have quizzes. The first quiz is due, I believe, Saturday at just before midnight, right? 11.59 p.m. And the second quiz is due next Tuesday, right? I will be in office hours tomorrow or at, what did we say? I think it's three to four at this same link, right? So at the same Zoom link, I'll hang around in the Zoom room probably for the first 10 or 15 minutes or so. Um, so it's good if you can come at the beginning of this time. If you think you'll come later in the time, I'd appreciate sort of some kind of an email that's just a heads up because uh, there's nothing more boring than waiting in an empty Zoom room for an hour. <laughs> that's probably not exactly true, but it is pretty boring. So if you give me a heads up, if you're going to come later in the time, otherwise I'd appreciate it if you could come earlier. Um, and then we can meet again on Monday at 4 o'clock. I'll put that information on the My Courses site before I leave RIT today. So that's it for now. Um, happy Canada Day tomorrow. Um, it's July 1st, right? Um, right? Canada's independence is kind of funny because um, you know, America obviously fought for their independence. And then after that, it was super expensive for the British. So in Canada, we just asked, you know, is it okay if we make a country? And they said, yeah, that's good. But we still have the queen on the money, so I don't know if we're exactly an independent country. Um, so I hope you have a great weekend. Um, it's a bunch of stuff to do. Remember that the homework problems and the homework solutions are posted on the My Courses site. So, um, you know, you can look at those solutions, but my advice to you strongly is to attempt to do them by yourself first. Because that's how we learn by struggling. And then uh, you can go into the solutions after to kind of get a feel for what you're comfortable with, what you know, and maybe what you need to work on a little bit more. So after all that rambling, I'll let you go. Uh, and I will see you either tomorrow, Monday, or next Tuesday. Thanks, everybody. Yep, you too.